Good evening. Good evening. Well, hey, welcome to week 19. Yeah, I know. I just, that's what I was thinking. What? Week 19, uh, what about dinosaurs, part two. Let me take my watch off. That way I'll know that time does not matter. We can just... <laughs> So last week we looked at What About Dinosaurs Part 1. Obviously we'll finish up the topic of What About Dinosaurs tonight. We'll move into next week, Lord willing, What About the Supposed Evolution of Man. And then finally we'll end week 21 with the magnificence, the beauty, the awesomeness of the creation. And as I've told you, if you can only make one, one of the 21, make number 21. That would be the one I would encourage you to come to. So that's the, what's left. Uh, working definitions, we'll have the same definition we did last week. Obviously, if you remember what it was, anybody remember the word we looked up last week? Dragon. Pastor reminded us uh, as he was talking about it. The word dinosaur, as we talked about last week, was invented by Sir Richard Owen in 1841. Before that, those large serpents that they found would have been known as dragons. And we'll look more at that tonight. We just briefly touched upon it last week. If you go to Merriam-Webster's Dictionary Online, you'll find indeed the first usage, although it's archaic, that means it's an older usage of the word, for the word dragon is a huge serpent. And then we have the mythological definition as the second definition there at Merriam-Webster's. So last week we set about to answer three questions, if you remember them. The first one was, does the Bible indicate that men and dinosaurs live together? We'll briefly run back over that, but it was clear that it did, it does. Is there any evidence that would support dinosaurs lived thousands, not millions of years ago? We're not quite done with that, um, but we could encapsulate the greatest evidence of all, and that's carbon-14 dating. That's blood cells and tissue cells and bone uh, tissue cells and even DNA found in non-completely fossilized dinosaur bones. Absolutely, they're not millions of years old. They're not tens of millions of years old. They definitely lived very recently. Uh, we'll finish answering question number two, just one more thing to say there, and then we'll move into does secular history indicate that men and dinosaurs possibly live together? So we'll step outside the Bible, step away from just scientific evidence, and just look at secular history. So that's what we have on tap for tonight. So did you know, this is from last week, I told you the Hebrew word tanin, used 28 times in the Old Testament, often in our King James, New King James, ESV, New Revised Standard Version, it's translated as dragon. This is from Henry Morris's um, book, The Biblical Basis for Modern Science. He says this, If one will simply translate tanin by dinosaur, every one of the more than 25, 28 to be exact, uses of the word becomes perfectly clear and appropriate. We looked at just a few of those last week, in particular, where, where Yahweh told Moses his staff was going to become a tanin. And sure enough, in the presence of Pharaoh, it did. Not a serpent, not a snake, a dragon. A dinosaur, and we talked about that last week. We looked at two different animals from the book of Job. This is the animal known as Behemoth from Job chapter 40. Again, God is parading this animal in front of Job to remind Job of God's greatness, of God's magnificence, of God's power. So this is not a pretend animal. This is not a make-believe animal. Job didn't go, God, I don't know what you're talking about. Job knew exactly what God was talking about. So God said, look now at the behemoth, he's speaking to Job, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now his strength is in his hips, his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. He was the first or the most powerful or the most awesome of, God's, of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Again, no doubt there's only one animal that's walked on this planet who could be described this way, especially having a tail like a cedar tree, and that's an 80 to 100 foot long, 80 ton, seropod dinosaur. There's no doubt about what Job was being reminded of when God is speaking. One chapter later, no one is so fierce that he would dare stir him. This is referring to Leviathan, named a few verses up. Who then is able to stand against me. That's Yahweh speaking. He brings forth this mighty, powerful, sea-dwelling animal, and he said, no one would stand before him if I created him who would dare stand before me. You get the point. Who has preceded me that I should pay him? Everything under heaven is mine, God says. 
I will not conceal his limbs, that's Leviathan's, his mighty power or his graceful proportions. Who can remove his outer coat? That would have been his plate of armor that was outside his skin. Who can approach him with a double bridle? It's a rhetorical question. The answer would be no one. Who can open the doors of his face with his terrible teeth all around? His rows of scales are his pride shut up tightly as with a seal. One is so near another, that's his scales, that's his armor plating, that no air comes between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together. They cannot be parted. His sneezings flash forth as light. His eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth goes burning light. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. That is, this is a sea dwelling, some type of fire or boiling liquid material breathing dragon dinosaur that Job knew about that's being paraded in front of Job. And we talked about the bombardier beetle last week. We'll leave him off the table for tonight. So does the Bible indicate men and dinosaurs possibly live together? Absolutely. And let's be honest, the creation story doesn't give us any other place to put them. They were created in creation reek, alongside man, just as God had told Job. To the second question. Is there any evidence that would support that dinosaurs lived thousands, not millions of years ago? So first, we looked at soft tissue. We looked at blood cells. We looked at bone marrow. We looked at DNA that's been found in not completely, completely fossilized dinosaur bones last week. So just a short video clip from Evolution's Achilles heel to kind of summarize this whole point for us before we move forward. For about a decade now, about a decade there's been mounting now, evidence been mounting of soft tissue, of tissue that's, that's still preserved still inside, preserved dinosaur, inside bones. dinosaur bones. Now, if these bones are supposed now, to be millions, millions and millions of years old, the soft, tissues, the like soft tissues like blood vessels and, and red blood cells and, blood cells and other materials and other should have long since degraded. Long since degraded. But starting in 2005, starting in 2005 with the discovery of a dinosaur blood bone from Tyrannosaurus rex, there were these different soft tissues that were in there, and they were still stretchy. A blood vessel that could actually be taken with tweezers and stretched out would snap back into to place. Step back into place. More material was discovered, More material was discovered. Different, different types of proteins, different have, been proteins have been identified in laboratories, and now there are now mounting, there mounting are evidences mounting coming evidences in from a wide, from wide from range of different types of fossil animals, animals, animals from the so-called so age, so age of dinosaurs. We've got Tyrannosaurus rex, Tyrannosaurus rex, Triceratops, Triceratops, a duck-billed dinosaur, duck dinosaur uh, even eggs, uh, even eggs from sauropod, from sauropod dinosaurs. This is the long neck ones, ones uh, from China. Uh, from and China. so, and so with, mounting with mounting evidence now from, from not, only not only North America, North America and not just one unit in North America, but from multiple levels of rock in the in the record and from different continents, soft tissue is being identified more and more by more researchers in paleontology. In 2013, in 2013, a remarkable, a remarkable paper, paper, was paper was published documenting the discovery of bone, discovery cells, of and bone cells and from DNA bone. from dinosaur bones. Now, they proved the DNA proved with three DNA independent with three chemical independent tests, chemical and they also tests. found DNA also found in certain DNA parts in of the cell, parts which is just what we'd expect to find if it was in a cell nucleus. Also, they found also proteins they found called histones, and that's where and DNA that's is coiled up in dinosaur cells. They would not be found in bacteria. So this, rules out, so this rules out contamination. So the recent experiments, so the recent experiments on how fast on how DNA, breaks breaks DNA breaks down shows that even under ideal, ideal conditions, it would not last would anywhere not near last the time since the dinosaurs, dinosaurs were meant to have become extinct. These ideal conditions, These ideal conditions are, temperatures well are temperatures well below freezing. Now, in real life, now, dinosaurs, real life dinosaurs were meant to have lived in very warm climates and warmth means that DNA would decay even more quickly. Therefore, uh, the Therefore, presence of uh, DNA, presence in DNA in dinosaur bones is very strong is very evidence strong against strong the millions, of years, against the millions of years time scale. So, the dirty little paleontolo paleontological secret I revealed last time was the carbon-14, the radioactive carbon dating of every dinosaur bone that we've submitted for sample. All of them have returned to date. The max age for carbon-14 dating, depending on the equipment, is 70,000, 75,000 at the very tops. They should all be radioactive carbon deplete. They all have the presence of radioactive carbon. They're not hundreds of thousands of years old. 
They're not millions of years old. They're not tens of millions of years old. But there's another dirty little paleontological secret that we're not being told as well. And that's in this supposed geological column. They find common mammals, modern day mammals, right alongside the dinosaur bones that they uncover, the dinosaur fossils. They simply throw them to the side. They have no interest in them. But again, when we come to realize this, it compresses the supposed millions of years timeline and puts modern mammals living right alongside dinosaurs. This next video clip is again from Creation uh, Ministries Live. It's the supposed evolution of mammals and birds, and here they talk about this dirty little paleontological secret. A question, a question that, that has that been has thrown, been at, thrown us at us is, is then, how, then come how come we don't we find don't other find animal other fossils an buried, with fossils, fossils. buried with right. dinosaur fossils? Uh, and of right. course, when I was in school, uh, of course, I when I was in school, I the evolutionary paradigm. Usually, usually you see a diagram like this. See a diagram like this. Screen where you know basically where, say, well, you only find these creatures buried in these layers, buried layers. You know, there's an upward progression. Finally, you get to the dinosaurs, and then you get some mammals, and you get some mammals, and people on the scene. So it's always that. It's always that progression. Now, I know that that's know not always, that that's the not way always found. There is the way a, a there pattern is a, to the fossil pattern record, to the fossil but, record um, but uh, um, a lot of times uh, what we find in the ground doesn't actually match does that evolutionary that story. story. So, so one day I, so I took three hours, I, I took three hours and I went looking online and I looked for evidence that showed that modern type creatures buried with dinosaurs. So let me just share some of the results. They've actually found. The first article they've actually found. The first article I found is called Ruffles Feathers. Well, why did the finding of this duck ruffle these scientists' feathers? Because it was found in a rock layer that they found in a rock layer that they believe is 70 million years old. So now you've got ducks. So now you've got living with ducks. Dinosaurs living with dinosaurs. Dinosaur air birds. Dinosaur air birds. I thought it was a repeat of the first article. I thought it was a repeat of the first article. But I kept reading, and actually, I kept reading, and actually, it wasn't like this. This supposedly a duck-like creature supposedly 100 years old. This is 40 million years old. This is 40 million years old. They say that the soft tissues were preserved, soft tissues, including flight feathers and webbing, like duck. Feathers and the bird's toes. It's bird's supposedly toes. 110 million it's years old. It's supposedly 110 um, million years old. They called it a Gansas. Um, they call it a Gansas. Cooler if you give it a Latin name, I guess. Right, sure. Uh, and uh, here's right, a, sure. a picture uh, of what the, uh, here's an artist. Picture of what the, but it's got an modern drew. characteristics. But it's got like modern knees, characteristics. Uh, it was an underwater knees, swimmer. Uh, it was an underwater skin of the web feet. Again, this is supposedly 110 million years old. They've still found the webbing and all this stuff. The webbing and all this stuff. And I thought it was an interesting quote at the end of the article. It may have looked like a duck. It may have looked like a duck. It may have looked like a duck. And acted Gansas like a duck. Was no Gansas. Gansas. There's, there's, no there's a duck. saying that kind of goes the other <laughs> direction. It goes the other <laughs> direction. People <laughs> might be familiar <laughs> with. It looks like a duck. It looks like a duck. It looks like a duck. They don't think it's a duck. They don't think it's a duck. It's 110 million years old. Anyway, we don't believe in this. We don't believe in this. We're just showing you what we've found. Then I found this one. Then I found this one. It was a flying squirrel. It was a flying squirrel. I used to work with my folks up in Ontario, Pickle Lake. My mom was always trying to detect pies and stuff like that. Pies and stuff like that from flying squirrels. This flying squirrel is supposedly at least 65 years old. So now the squirrels have been living with dinosaurs. Then I found this one. It was a hundred. Then I found this one. It was a hundred year old platypus. And it's got the electrosensors down the bill. It looks like any kind of modern platypus. Platypus have been living with dinosaurs according to the fossil record. Wow. So record. Wow. Then I found this one. Then I found Easter this one. Surprise. Easter surprise. Wolves, Wolves, oldest rabbit bones. Rabbit bones. Well, this guy's supposedly, well, this guy's supposedly uh, 53, million uh, 53 million years old. But the the researcher, but the, the who, the researcher who found him, Dr. Weibel, Weibel, Weibel said he wouldn't be surprised if he went out into the field, into the field and found an 80 million year old rabbit. Million year old so according to evolution, so according they have no problem that they have no problem that you know he's open to the idea of having rabbits 80 million years old living at the same time as dinosaurs. And I found this one. And I found this one. It's a it's a beaver. Beaver. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a hundred and fifty four million year old beaver. Million year old beaver. So now the beavers and so the, the beavers and the dinosaurs. Together, then this together. one, then this one, a hundred and thirty million year old beaver. Didn't know what it was. Uh, didn't know what it was. Uh, but it had eaten. Uh, but the it dinosaur. The dinosaur. The stomach contained the, the, the digest, digest, digest remains of oh, okay. remains of oh, okay. a psychosaurus. Oh, okay. Pretty sure. Pretty sure. Lived at the same time as the dinosaur. Time as the dinosaur. They called it a raptor. They called it a raptor. Mammoth robustus. Again, this sounds cool. If you get a Latin name, if you get a Latin name, but that mammoth robustus looks like modern day looks like modern day honey badger. Now, now, basically, what basically what, what the fossil record what is the showing, record here, is I mean, showing for, those here, right? watching, for those of you who are watching, for those of you are watching, has your age of dinosaurs, 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 din
how to simple internet search. Simple internet search. That's right. Amazing. Lots, lots amazing. of uh, lots evidence, of, uh, that, evidence that, that you know that, modern you know, type modern creatures type have existed, creatures have existed alongside, alongside dinosaurs. Alongside so, dinosaurs. So, um, great um, evidence for what the Bible said. What the Bible said. Flood. Global flood. Where the creatures died out. And that's the tip of the iceberg. Again, that's the second dirty little secret. They're finding all these modern-day animals right alongside. Give them a Latin name, um, draw a cute picture of them. What we're finding is the geological column is a completely made-up column, and we're finding modern animals right alongside animals that are supposedly 140, 50, 60 million years old. But I remind you about the coelacanth. Maybe you don't remember the coelacanth. It looks like colacanth, but it's pronounced coelacanth. Maybe you don't remember the coelacanth, but he was a fish that existed between 80 and 40 million years ago. That's when he lived. Scientists were sure. They were so sure of his time that he lived that he became what is known as an index fossil. That means if you found him, you knew that the ground you were digging in was somewhere between 80 million and 400 million years old. So that way you could go and everything else you found there, you knew that's how old it was because the coelacanth fossil was there. He was an index fossil. Well, that was until 1938, when we found one in a fish market in Madagascar. We've since caught over 200. You can buy one on the internet. You can have your own coelacanth. You can go swimming with the coelacanths. Keep in mind, this was an index fossil that had went extinct 80 million years ago, still alive and kicking. Not only is he a current living animal that lived 400 million years ago with the dinosaurs, unchanged, by the way, I might add. And the speculation was, before they found him, that these lobe fins had turned into legs, and he had crawled out, and he was one of the animals on the land. That was until 1938, when we found one in a fish market in Madagascar and completely blew the whole thing up. He's no longer, as you might imagine, an index fossil, but let's face it, the whole thing was a joke anyway. He never was an index fossil. So to the second question, is there any evidence that would support dinosaurs lived thousands, not millions of years ago? Absolutely, there's a host of it. Again, we're scratching the surface. Now let's run off to our third question. Does secular history indicate that men and dinosaurs possibly lived together? This next video clip is Dr. Jason Lyle from Answers in Genesis. It's from the video Dra Dinosaurs in the Bible. He talks about the legends of dragons. That being the case, would you expect to the find case, some legends of dinosaurs, dinosaurs in history? Dinosaurs keeping in mind, they're, they're not going to be called dinosaurs, it's a modern, modern word. word. But will we find legends of dragons? Do we find legends of dragons? Do we find legends of dragons? You, you bet. Dragons? bet. We find lots of legends of dragons. Like the legend of St. George and the legend of St. George. The legend goes that St. George came into this town. The town was being victimized by a dragon that was eating their livestock. And they were actually going to sacrifice a lady to this dragon, hoping to appease it. St. George rides in, slays the dragon, saves the lady, converts the town to Christianity. People say, oh, that's just a myth. Well, maybe. On the other hand, maybe this was a real creature that he came in and killed. Maybe it was a dinosaur. We've actually found fossils of baryonyx, a sort of a type of dinosaur in that region. Did you know that Marco Polo in AD twelve seventy one reported that the Chinese royal chariots were occasionally pulled by dragons? In the year 1611, the, the Chinese uh, emperor appointed the position of royal dragon feeder, which hardly makes sense if there were no dragons to feed, doesn't it? 1611, not that, not that long ago, really, not, certainly not millions of years ago. And there are lots of legends of various dragons. There's a city in France that was renamed in the honor of the killing of a dragon there. The animals described as being larger than an ox and had long, sharp, pointed horns on its head. It sounds a little bit like a triceratops, doesn't it? Around the year 900, there was an Irish writer who recorded an encounter with a large animal, a creature had a head shaped somewhat like a horse's and had iron on its tail that pointed backwards, had thick legs and strong claws. The description matches no dinosaurs, it's just stegosaurus and kentrosaurus. Can't be sure, but it sure sounds like one. This one's a really well documented case. And, and on May 13th, 1572, around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, there was an Italian peasant who was walking behind his cart. His oxen were pulling the cart and they got down on the road because there was a little hissing dragon up in front of them. And this, uh, the man actually had a rod with him at the time. It was actually a small creature and he came up and whacked it on his head and killed it. 
it, and he brought the body into a, a naturalist at the time, Ulysses Andrevandus, who carefully studied the carcass and reported that it was unquestionably a reptile, one unlike any others he had seen. It had a very long, slender neck and a thick body. The description fits that of a Tanistrophius. So we think we might actually know what species it was for the description. What about the flying reptiles? Any uh, records of those? Well, we do have records of flying reptiles in recorded history. The Greek historian Herodotus uh, records an encounter with these winged serpents, flying reptiles. He says uh, he, he, he finds out about this this place where there are lots of lots of these uh, flying reptiles, which sound an awful lot like Ram Ferencus, one of these small flying reptiles that have a long tail. And he goes to this valley to find out about them. He says, I went to learn about the winged serpents. When I arrived there, I saw innumerable bones and backbones of serpents, many heaps of backbones, great and small, and even smaller. Winged serpents are said to fly from Arabia at the beginning of each spring, making for Egypt, but the ibis birds encountered the invaders in this pass and killed them. And the legends say that the Egyptians used to worship the ibis birds because the ibis birds killed the Ramphorhynchus. The Ramphorhynchus were poisonous. So it did them a little service, and the Egyptians worshiped the ibis birds for that. He says the, uh, the serpents are like water snakes. Their wings are not feathered. Wings are not but very feathered. like the wings of a bat. Very like the wings so he's going out of his way to say this isn't a bird. It's not feathered. It's got, it's got, it's got wings like a bat, membranous kind of wings, and it's a, and it's a serpent, and therefore a reptile. Flying reptile, really amazing. So this next clip is again a little bit more on dragons. This is from Creation Live. Again, as the flag of Wales actually has a dragon on it, um, some of the biblical um, commentaries the biblical from several hundred years ago actually referenced years ago, people seeing yes, dragons. Yes, very old books. Yeah, very yes, old right. books. The, um, yes. the Zodiac, the Chinese Zodiac, Zodiac has, Chinese has all these Zodiac animals that we readily recognize. Real animals, yes, plus a dragon. Why one mythological? Why one mythological? Mark Polo, Mark Polo, he was well known historian, and he describes seeing these reptiles, these dragons, these dragons. Some of the artifacts we found, of course, one of the oldest. Artifacts, so artifacts ever found was this Mesopotamian cylinder seal. And if you look at the creatures and there, if you look four at the legs, big long four neck, legs, big long big, neck, uh, big, uh, big long tail. Uh, Long tail looks like a uh, looks you know, like a, one of the you know, sauropod dinosaurs. Of the, sauropod dinosaurs. Uh, the head looks right. a little different, uh, but the head looks right. a little different. But you don't know soft tissue. You don't it's interesting too how they, they have their necks wrapped around each other. Yeah, and keep that in mind. Yeah, and keep that in mind. Some other interesting artifacts they found. Interesting artifacts they found. Of course, Dracorex. Of course, Dracorex. You did an article on that. You did an article on that. Yeah, the article. Yeah, and what does it look like? I mean, what does it look like? I mean, even the funded is here. There's a little sign down there. There's a little sign down there. It's a dinosaur that looks like a dragon. Dinosaur that looks like a dragon. Well, that's what we've been. Uh, to make the connection between the dinosaurs and dragons even stronger. I mean, here's a thing that looks exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Carl Sagan. Um, one's called the smartest man in America. Of course, he's an atheist. Wrote the book Dragons of Eden, trying to explain why people groups all over the world call themselves Christians. Wrote the book Dragons of Eden, trying to explain why people groups all over the world have these memories of seeing these dinosaurs. He's not a Christian. What did he say? Well, basically, he came up with this thought that basically in our past, when we were just some greedy little mammal or something, we saw these dinosaurs. We saw these dinosaurs, and it was so frightening, and it was that, it so frightening that it imprinted in, the, in our memories. In the, somehow in our, in our DNA, somehow in our and that DNA, memory got passed and that memory along. got passed. Till finally we evolved till into humans. Evolved Here we are, humans. and we remember we are, seeing these things. But of course, we didn't live with those. Of course, we didn't live with those. I mean, that's possible. And that's, I mean, that's what, that's what possible. he said in his book. That's what he said in his book. That's what he said in his book. He makes a connection between dragons. He says that many cultures have these legends and all that kind of stuff. So, just astounding evidence. Cambodia. Uh, Cambodia. Uh, 800 years ago, they carved uh, a stone ago, they column. You look in the center of the column, what's you look it look like? I, I do column, dinosaur talks with like? kids, I, I do four dinosaur legs, talks with you can see the creature's tail, you can see the creature's You got seven-year-old kids, that's a stegosaurus. You got seven-year-old kids, that's a stegosaurus. They didn't have dinosaur books and land before time in Jurassic Park 800 years ago in Cambodia. Maybe they had real live dinosaurs. So maybe they had real live dinosaurs. Well, that's probably what they saw. Here's Bishop Bell. Here's Bishop Bell. His... Tomb, his, his, Carlock uh, Cathedral. Tomb, you see the Carlock creatures Cathedral. there. You see uh, the creatures like there. Uh, they and look like dinosaurs. They look like dinosaurs. They've got their, their necks wrapped around each other too. Just, around like just like the Mesopotamian cylinder seal. Just like the Separated hundreds of years, separated uh, hundreds chronologically, of years, and hundreds uh, chronologically, and hundreds of miles of distance. And yet people record the same activity. And yet people record the same activity. Thousands of legends of people seeing or killing dragons. If you're interested in this thing, Carl Schuker's book would be the place I would direct you to. It is interesting when you think about the Chinese zodiac. Eleven real animals, ox, rat, dog, rooster, and one mythological creature, a dragon. This is a slate palette from uh, King Nimer. Uh, he was the first king of the United Egypt. Notice on this slate these long-necked animals, dragons. And notice 
these Egyptians appear to have them lassoed. Here's a mock-up of it for, so you can see it clearer. Down here we have a bull, that's easily recognizable. But here we have these long-necked animals that the Egyptians are controlling. I would submit unto you that was a dinosaur. This is another Egyptian plate. Look at these long-necked monsters. They are actually eating a bull, so that gives you an idea of their size in comparison. Again, I would submit unto you that what the Egyptians are carving on this plate is two dinosaurs that are consuming a bull. They're fighting over a bull, actually. This is the hippo tusk. It's a magic wand, 12th century uh, B.C. there in Egypt. Notice again this long-necked creature carved on this magic wand from the 12th century. Babylon has been found. I don't know if you've actually studied this. This is very interesting. The, this is the remains of the Ishtar Gate. Um, this is from the book, The Rise of, the, of Babylon by Charles Dyer, the rebuilding of the city. What's interesting about it, uh, in the rebuild, there's these bricks about every 10 feet. Here's what they say. I am Saddam Hussein. I have rebuilt, the ba I have rebuilt Babylon the Great. I am the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and this is placed throughout the rebuilt city of Babylon. Um, this is actual, this is in the museum in Germany. Um, you can see that relief of a lion there. And there's also these reliefs, actually taken from the original walls. That is a dragon. The gates of Babylon, the Ishtar Gate. This is a redo of the Ishtar Gate. But it's covered in bulls and lions and dragons. And that's some, obviously, U.S. soldiers walking through that uh, mock up there in, in um, Iraq. Alexander the Great reported that when he conquered parts of what is now um, India in 326, that his soldiers were scared of the dragons that they ran into in the caves. I would submit unto you the dragons that they ran into in the caves that they were fearful of were dinosaurs. It is interesting that Viking ships often have a dragon head on the headmast, a dinosaur head. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, a great book I would send you to would be, oh, sorry, After the Flood. Um, we talked about this in the video. I did want you to see it, though. This is a brass carving of a pair of dinosaurs. This is 15th century uh, Cathedral Carlisle there in England. Um, why would anyone carve dinosaurs around their tomb unless maybe even in the 15th century they had seen them? The Crest of Lithuania, again, a knight fighting a small dragon. Russian medallion, a knight fighting a small dragon. This is a Bulgarian postage stamp. This guy with a bow and arrow shooting at the large eyed, long neck with small wings dragon. Um, the next story I'm going to tell you about, I almost didn't tell you. There's so much uh, controversy on this point, um, but I felt like I had to because I think it's worth the ride. Sandy, if you would pass this around. Um, this is a story of the Nazca Indians and burial stones known as Ica stones, if you'll just get it started here and run it around, that we found in over, gosh, probably the last 500 years. A fantastic book, if this interests you, is this book here, The Secrets of the Ica Stones and the Nazca Lines. You're probably familiar with the Nazca Lines there in Peru. Uh, this is the Nazca Indians. It's the same Indians. And so if you're interested in that, uh, that would be the book I would send you to. Now, truth in advertising. Um, there's no doubt been a lot of these stones that have been forged, especially over the last 100 years because people have been buying them. So truth in advertising, if you get online and you read something about a forged stone, there are no doubt many forged stones. But I'm going to show you some things tonight. There are also no doubt many legitimate stones. So let's get going. So there's the book, again, the story of the Ica Stones and the Nazca Lines. We're talking about South America. In particular, we're talking about the Nazca Indians. They live from 300 B.C. to 800 A.D. Uh, we're talking about Ica, Peru, very dry area. Uh, things preserve well there. So the story, um, carved by the Nazca Indians who lived in the desert region there between 300 B.C. and 800 A.D., they put these stones in their burial vaults uh, when they buried their dead. They would occasionally place pottery and other items in the tomb as well, burial shrouds, again, um, in honor of that one they were burying. The first mention of these stones is from a Spanish priest journeying to the region of Ica in, 19, or excuse me, in 1535. Uh, Father Simon, he was a Jesuit, a Jesuit Catholic missionary. 
1562, Spanish explorers sent some of these stones back to Spain. And then in the 1900s, explorers, grave robbers, and others stumbled upon these things. And that's when they really started to get attention. And that's even probably when some started to be copied. What is carved on these stones breaks down into three major categories. The first one are vulgar depictions that we won't talk about. Just that you know that that's one of the subjects. The other one is various surgeries, like if you study these stones, it's people with their head open and it looks like they're operating, operating on cut off arms, operating on cut off legs, that's the second category. And the third category of these Ica stones is dinosaurs. Lots of dinosaurs interacting with each other and interacting with people. The stones vary in size from very small to very large, and you'll see some. The current estimate of stones is between 50 to 55,000. We have no idea how many of those are legitimate and how many of those are forged. The largest collection is the late Dr. Javier Cabrera's museum. His son now runs that museum um, as the curator. And the current estimate of the stones in that museum is about 15,000. So if you make it to Ica, Peru, you may want to stop by and visit the museum. Um, the largest find occurred in 1961. The Ica River flooded and it uncovered an entire burial zone and exposed a lot of these stones. Now to this day, forged and real stones can be purchased in Peru. And one has to know what one's looking for to understand the difference. The forgeries are obvious. When viewed under magnification, they show recent tooling marks, they show sharp cuts, they show metal flakes that are left behind. It's clear they were produced recently. There's no patina overgrowth on the stones. When you know what you're looking for, it's clear they're a forgery. They're not ancient, they're not hundreds of years old, they're hundreds of minutes old, and it's very obvious. Now, there's a key point, though, that I want you to hear from me in case you miss it as you go to research this. Up until 1979, we had the wrong head on every brontosaurus exhibit that we had. Now you may wonder, how in the world an 80 ton, 80 foot long dinosaur, Pastor, how'd we get the wrong head? Well, as you might imagine, contrary to the evolutionary thought that just thinks these guys just fall over and die and get turned into fossils, the reason they got turned into fossils was because they were involved in the catastrophe of the global's flood, which swept them all over the place and oftentimes broke them apart. And that small head would be detached from that long neck. Sometimes the neck would be detached from the body. And so for years they were doing the best they could, but they had the wrong head. Um, so at any rate, there, there's the backstory. This is the old head. So when you look on the internet and you find that sort of bulbous head, that is the wrong head. That's the pre-1979 head, and the internet just hasn't caught up with the reality. The real head we now know looks more like a serpent head. It's a very narrow head, long and skinny. In 1979, David Berman and John McIntosh of the Carnegie Institute brought this to light. They had studied notebooks, they had studied all this stuff, and they proved the case that, hey, this entire time we've been putting the wrong head on all these brontosaurus exhibits. Fair enough. Here's what's interesting. A few of the Ica stones have brontosauruses depicted on them. All are depicted with the correct head. Every one of them. That narrow head. Equally, we have a picture that dates to uh, 16, or excuse me, 1969 of, the, of Javier Cabrera at his desk with one of those stones with a narrow head. That's before anyone knew it was the wrong head on the rest of the planet. How is that possible? How is it possible that something that took us hundreds of years to figure out was correctly carved on these make-believe Ica stones? I'll tell you how it's possible. Because these stones are not make-believe. These Nazca Indians were carving things they were doing and seeing. This is the late... Uh, Dr. Cabrera, these are some of the stones. You can see the stones behind him. You can see there's little things, but then there's also stones that are this big. They're stones you and I cannot pick up. This is another room in his museum. As you can see, there are a couple of stones in that room. Now, do I believe every one of these is legitimate? No. I bet there's forgeries mingled throughout this. Here's the point. You can find the forgeries. They've already figured this out. This book will explain this skeptic who did not believe in these things, who went to study this, came back amazed and a believer in what's, what these things are depicting. Here's one of the Ica stones. You can see the dinosaurs. There's a triceratops, 
uh, various dinosaurs just carved on the relief of this stone. T-Rex. Look at this guy. He's riding a tri triceratops, smoking a peace pipe, I guess. I'm not sure. Here's a T-Rex grabbing a guy by the neck. That's the stone that's floating around. That, by the way, that is not a real stone. That is a replica. Made of plastic. I probably couldn't afford a real stone. But that's a replica of that stone. And truth is, that's probably a replica too. Um, there's another stone. You can see there's an interaction here. This guy appears to be spearing the dinosaur, but the dinosaur is not giving up without, the dragon is not giving up without a fight. Another one. Ooh, he wins. He took the head off with whatever he had there. Another one. Riding. Three dinosaurs and two fighting, one watching. But now here's what's interesting. Notice these little circular patterns. You guys kind of think it's like Nazca Indian art, right? Just being artsy. Well, it turns out it's, well, oh, they have it too. A little circular patterns there. It turns out it's not artsy at all. We've now found a lot of dinosaur skin that has this pattern all over it, this circular pattern on the dinosaur skin. What we thought was artsy for years turns out to be what some dinosaur skin happens to look like. More of this dinosaur skin that has this circular pattern. This is a mummy that we found there in uh, graves in Peru. You can see the pottery, the skulls. He's in a funeral uh, cape. Um, and there's what we find on some of the pottery. Dragons. This is one of the burial shrouds. Notice what's on the burial shroud. What clearly appears to be dragons. Okay, if you're right, Rich, where are the dinosaurs? Well, we'll wrap up here. Many dinosaurs died after the flood due to the climate changes. We've talked about this. The atmosphere was much different then. The O2 content was much higher then. The, it was very hard for them to live. But their bigger problem was coming right after them, and that was man. Man was their bigger problem. Prior to the flood, there were a whole lot of animals and a few men. Following the flood, there were a few men and a few animals who were growing together, and the problem was the dinosaurs were now in an environment where they were not conducive to do well. So men killed them for meat. Men killed them because they were a menace. They wanted to be the hero. They wanted to prove their superiority. They wanted to get some land that the dinosaur was inhabiting. I'll leave you with this one little piece. 1925, this thing washed up in the beach in California. You can read about it in Shipwrecks and Sea Monsters off the California coast. You can see the thing's head. I'll give you a better picture. Um, there it is there. The neck is about 20 feet long, has a body, has flippers, and has a head. Um, the witnesses wrote this, two of them. My examination of the monster was quite thorough. It had no teeth. Its head is large. Its neck is fully 20 feet long. The body's weak. The tail is only three feet in length. From the end of the backbone with a bill like it possesses, it must have lived on herbage and undoubtedly inhabited a swamp. No, in fact, it was in the ocean, but that's fine. And I would call it a type of plesiosaurus. Another witness, Judge W.R. Springer of Santa Cruz, felt the creature was from a prehistoric age. He added his observation evidence of two short feet or flippers. It probably swam with its head high above the water, exactly like we believe that plesiosaurs did. Um, if this kind of stuff interests you, there's tons of it. Does secular history and commitment and dinosaurs possibly live together? Absolutely. Absolutely. But there's one other point, as I shared with you maybe before, if you were here, I have photo evidence. So that puts the deal to rest that men and dinosaurs live together. Thank you. <laughs>